So I'd like to start by just welcoming everyone um, who's here for the session on, on smart power for rural development, but really more broadly the, uh, the opportunities around extending energy access um, in India um, and the kinds of solutions and models that are rapidly evolving and rapidly emerging uh, through our experiences and the experiences of, 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 a, of an esteemed panel that I'm going to invite up. Um, we're going to be trying to do something in uh, a little bit compressed and ambitious in this session um, uh, where we'll talk firstly about with the panel about the range of issues that are being that need to be addressed and are being addressed um, in in addressing energy access and and, and decentralized uh, mini grids and extending those in rural India we want to then take a slightly deeper dive on the policy side and understand what some of those considerations are and particularly learn from the recent experiences of the state of Uttar Pradesh. And then uh, transition to a bit more of a fireside chat, talking really about the investment and economic side of, of this, because this is, of course, an emerging business model, one that still has a lot of refinement to take place. And, and both entrepreneurs as well as investors are, are sort of thinking together very intensely about, um, about what this next few years is going to look like and what the how the opportunity is going to evolve. Shashi Boluswar, um, who, ah, there you are, Shashi, co-founder of the uh, Institute for Transformative Technologies, um, and Manish Pawar, who's the principal coordinator of CAR, the Center for Advanced Research and Development. Um, we have a second set of panelists who we'll invite up later when we transition. Thank you, Ashwin. Uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, in brief, uh, the model uh, that we work with is called the ABC model. And uh, the ABC model stands for uh, having an anchor load uh, at every power plant. In our case, the anchor load is a telecom tower. And um, the B stands for uh, small and medium enterprises. So at every location, uh, the, the plant has uh, eight to 10 small and medium enterprises that it serves. Uh, and the C stands for rural communities and households. So there are hundreds of them at every location. So that's roughly the model. Uh, we operate in India and uh, starting to operate in Myanmar now. Uh, we will play the film now. Uh, which actually describes this uh, quite nicely. One quick question. So that's, that gives us a really rosy picture of, of what it's like to run a mini grid. I'm sure life is a lot more complicated than that. Given the business you're running, tell us what is the one thing that you are most worried about right now? I mean, uh, this business has uh, three cornerstones uh, in our assessment. Uh, the, the big ones uh, are Execution. This is all about execution uh, in a very, very, in, at the last mile. So execution is, is a big issue. Uh, funding, Ashwin, is still a big issue. Uh, and, um, and thirdly, policy and regulatory framework uh, is, is the third, I think, uh, big issue for this business. Uh, since we operate in UP, a lot has been done and we get an opportunity to, to hear what's been done. So I think this is what really keeps us awake. Manish, I'm going to bring you in now. Uh, you're working, so to speak, at the other end of the equation. You, you know your organization, you have deep experience in working in rural India, in promoting new enterprises, in seeing how rural livelihoods can be advanced. Um, so you're excited about engaging with an initiative, with an effort around that brings, seeks to bring energy, uh, electricity into areas that are underserved or not served at all. How does that fundamentally change the opportunities of the landscape in a typical village or a typical area that you're working in? What are you seeing as the kind of dynamics and opportunities being created uh, when energy enabled enterprises becomes a reality or a case of potential in any given context? We are a voluntary organization working in Central India on rural livelihoods. And we see that there is always a demand in rural area. But there is no surety of electricity, a short supply. So either we compromise or pay more. Pay more doesn't work for long. We need a sustainable solution like these mini grids. And we 
we are very much excited to implement this program within next 12 to 24 months. That we will try to give some models of utilizing the electricity of many grids in creating sustainable attributes which will yield or activate give some prosperity to the area. And these models can be replicated to the other nearby areas having similar models. So there is always a demand. We just have to, like as you said, that uh, uh, area is agriculture very sound, have tremendous potential of creating micro enterprises on agri and allied activities. We have also proposed some of the activities, like beekeeping, ultimately to the honey processing, hatchery ultimately to the uh, poultry sectors, and there is a market. And along with this, uh, we also think that value chain development activities are also should be there to create a reliable supply chain for sustainability of these micro enterprises. So, I mean, the of course, the rural India is not standing still. Even areas that don't have a reliable grid, there's a lot of vandalism, economic activities taking place. You've talked a, a, more about sort of, I guess, agricultural related industries, value chain uh, enterprises. Are you seeing opportunities outside the farm sector as well in rural areas? What sorts of enterprises do you think are likely to be um, encouraged as a result of the arrival of reliable power beyond the, the ag value chain enterprises? Um, apart from farm sector, there are so many sectors of non-farm sector which are utilized, which can be utilized in the rural areas, like trail breaking and etc. and some uh, micro enterprises based on some rural small things like um, grocery shops, uh, computer trading centers, etc. These are also can be these limited supplies can also be utilized in these areas also. But I think as an volume organization, our main job is not to have a micro enterprise, but first to create entrepreneurs. Because our first job is to identify the potential entrepreneurs build their capacities in utilizing the available natural resources and then creating micro enterprise so that the whole supply chain can be under level. So I think our main stress should be on creating uh, basically uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, we are working in the rural areas for so many years. We believe that the success percentage of micro enterprise development it totally depend upon how you build their capacities in utilizing these resources. So I think uh, this model will definitely replicate in uh, other parts. Thank you. The twin imperatives of providing reliable energy during peak hours to rural households with sustainable environmental cost is what is driving the non-conventional energy largely. In major, major parts of northern India, the sources of non conventional energy would be solar and biomass. Out of the solar, there are four different ways in which governments are attempting to promote. One is the large grid connected solar power plants, which you keep reading in newspapers, 10 megawatts, 20 megawatt solar plants. The second is the rooftop solar plants. The third is solar household items like solar pumps, solar lanterns, solar mobile chargers, and the fourth is this solar mini grids or off grids. Naipaul once wrote a book of India a million mutinies now. So I'm I think all of them has their own space and all of them can operate. We in Uttar Pradesh have a policy for grid connected solar policy, we have a policy and regulatory framework for rooftop and now we have a policy for mini grid health Backed by regulatory framework. Why I am speaking on Minigrid is probably because you want me to speak on Minigrid and also because UP is the only state which has a Minigrid policy, unlike in rooftop and grid connected where other states also have. It will be interesting to know how this policy and why this policy started before I go into the major features of this policy. What happened was around six months back, my then QIC, and this is real life story. She came to me that there is some companies who are actually putting up mini grids and they are not wanting any subsidy uh, from the government. They are putting up these mini grids and the villagers are very happy and they want to meet you. That is how this policy started. So we had a meeting with this policy and uh, 
we are trying to understand what is the business model. Because we have had many days before, largely through government grants, but this was a model in which we found that this is a business model. This was something which we found for the first time. And as Rohit explained, the ABC model, this is what he explained to me then around six months back. The proof of the case is eating. We went to the villages, we saw whether the villagers are satisfied or not, how their operators actually work. And then we, and through discussions we realized as has been pointed out by other people also, that there are four key stones to this, not three, actually four. One is entrepreneurship, one is technology, one is finance, and fourth is policy. In government, we can do this policy and regulatory part. The rest, there are other people in the panel. From there, we started, we realized that there's a need of policy, and which are the issues that an entrepreneur or an investor would be interested in to be addressed through that policy. This is a policy which actually followed the practice. There were people doing the, working on the ground and our policy was formulated by talking to them. So this is how the policy came out. It was launched in February this year. It was a few days back. There was a huge convention in Lucknow and the Chief Minister inaugurated it and he launched this policy. Many, some of you were there, some of you were not there, but it showed the backing of the Chief Minister for this policy. But the policy, I am happy to tell you that the policy has been followed up in, I think, record time by the regulatory framework by the Electricity Regulatory Commission, which has been issued on the 10th of April. So not only there is a policy, but there is a regulatory framework, and UP is the first in, I think, to the best of my knowledge, not only in country, but globally, to have both the policy as well as the regulatory framework. We, we don't claim that it, everything is hunky dory, that we have addressed all questions, but it is something that we attempted with all honesty. I will go through the basic features, I will not, the attractive features of the policy is that we are not saying that it is for villages which are off grid, which the grid has not arrived. We are leaving it to the players and my own understanding and my own experience of the villages is that the villages, even when the grid is there, are getting interested in getting connection through this mini grid player because they want Reliable supply during peak hour. What is important is the reliable supply during peak hour when they don't get the electricity through the grid even now. So even when the grid is there, they are actually interested in getting this connection through the mini grid player. We have left it open to the player that you can have it in a village where there is no mini grid or there is no grid, but you can also have it in a village where there is grid if you can think if you think that you are a viable player still. The maximum Capacity that we are given is 500 kilowatt, for which we define it is a mini grid. Now the grid policy basically has two components: one in which there is no government subsidy, and one in which there is a government subsidy. The one in which, which there is no government subsidy, we are acting as a facilitator. The basic problems are for the people who are wanting to put a mini grid without a uh, subsidy is that still there is a confusion, although the law is clear, that whether you require permission from the regulator or the DISCOM or the village panchayat or something. So the policy makes it very clear that you don't require any permission or any license to put up in any part of the rural UP a minimum. You don't require anything. You don't require any tariff consultation or any tariff justification. The tariff is left to you and the villagers themselves on mutual consent, which is something which many of the players could have had a problem with, but we deliberately kept it in that. So there is no uh, problem on the tariff front. Also, the advantages of the industrial policy, which we already has in 2012 will flow. There is a state nodal agency which will facilitate the removal of the problems. There is a high power committee headed with the chief secretary, and there is uh, the district master's role well defined for the right of way and things like that. But, as Ashwin said, that the main thing was the exit clause. I will come to the exit clause. Uh, the second part was the those villages where you require a viability gap. There we have said that in those where this, there is a subsidy which is to be given by government, then the service level agreements, the choice of villages and the tariffs has been defined in the policy itself. And then there will be bidding for viability gap. 
So we select the village, we fix up the tariff which is given in the policy, we fix up the number of hours that has to be supplied, and on that basis there will be bidding for the value again. So that is two parts of the policy. The exit clause, the ship shows that when or the grid comes or if the grid sub starts supplying energy to the to the extent that the mini grid operator now wants to back out, then there are two exit options. One is that the mini grid operator starts supplying energy to the display at a rate which is determined by the regulatory commission or through mutual consent. Or the second, that the infrastructure is given back to the discount at a rate which is determined now by the regulations. In the policy, the regulator actually went forward. The regulator on this regulatory commission uh, regulations of 10th April has actually defined the way in which the infrastructure cost will be determined, the depreciation method. So that ambiguity which was there in the policy has actually been addressed by the regulator. And also how the energy is to be bought from the player to the discount. They have also put a very interesting thing that as long as the mini grid operator is playing, the, the energy generated by him will be accounted to the renewable power obligation of the distribution company as a sweetener. But if they don't go for the exit clause, then the RPO will go, go back out of the discount's account. So it is a kind of incentivizing the discount to help the player exit at some point in time. The, both the policy and the regulations are in public domain in the respective websites of UP NEDA and UP Electricity Regulatory Commission. Uh, we did a lot of consultation with actual operators on the ground. We are still uh, in touch with them and we are in touch with some reality. But uh, I'm sure people can do even better and other states or the national government probably will come up with even better policies. But right now this is the only policy on table. This is the only regulatory framework on table. And as I told you that there are and as there are players already working in the state of Uttar Pradesh without subsidy, putting up 60, 70 villages already with thousands of customers connected to their mini grids. So therefore there's something which is happening which is viable without government subsidy and therefore some, there is something which should be looked at. Thank you. Thank you very much. My question is to both the commercial guys there and uh, on the policy side. Uh, between the central grid and uh, these last five mini grids, uh, we have differences in terms of cost of production of uh, power itself per unit, which will correspondingly translate into difference in the tariff uh, rate that's being offered. Additionally, there's a huge difference in the peak wattage that uh, the customer can draw as well as the number of units he can consume. So uh, most mini grids today are offering uh, two lights, one fan kind of uh, functionality uh, to the end customer. So given that, how do we see uh, mini grids actually completed? The second thing is, if you look at uh, what the REC app right now uh, shows, it shows that only 10,000 uh, villages currently are unelectrified and the central grid is being extended. So uh, given that the central grid will continue uh, to push on towards the last mile, how do we see mini grids uh, surviving that? So UP has decided that we will not uh, you know, push central grids to a region where they have not reached before and we will uh, let private players take it up, but that's not necessarily what's going to happen uh, everywhere. So uh, thoughts on that? Okay, um, yeah, why don't you jump in? I think UP, your assumption that UP has decided is not right. Okay. If you go to the same RSC app, you find that in UP there is not a single village which is now unidentified through the grid. So that's what I say, say that even if the grid is there, the villagers are opting for this mini grid parallel connection because of assured supply during peak hours. So typically if you go to the villager, you will have two connections. And um, that is one. So it is not exactly that if the grid comes automatically, this is not viable. But tariff comparison in that case? Second, the tariff is coming out because of his ABC model. The tariff for the common householder is down because of the ABC model cross subsidizing through the A and B. And therefore for the villager it is okay. But this is this can happen only in the villages where there is an A and B road. It may not happen in all villages and therefore this viability gap funding option is the problem. Let me just sort of um, emphasize though, I think the tariff differential tariff is a reality. 
Um, and, and so in a sense, you have to look at these as two quite different products. And, and, and consumers are making a choice about the price that they're willing to pay. Uh, but if you, if you convert it into a per unit cost, there's no question that grid electricity, grid electricity is significantly as, as much as a third or fourth cheaper. Uh, than uh, the uh, mini-grid power provided by companies like OMC. 